Hello, my name is Jerry Grieser. I'm a senior at Calvin studying German and economics, and I'm an intern at Calvin Student Alumni Association. I'd like to welcome you to the January series 2016. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones, and while you're doing that, we would like to give a special welcome today to the guests at three of our 45 remote webcast sites, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Palos Heights, Illinois, and Fremont, Michigan. We will be gathering questions today through Q&A cards available with our ushers or by email or Twitter. So feel free to think of those questions during the presentation today and start sending them in. Our moderator, Karen Sope, will gather the questions and present them at the end if time is allowed. And now, if you'll please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings and that we have the privilege of being here today. We thank you for this time of learning. Help, keeps our, help keep our minds attentive and our hearts open. In your name, amen. And now, Kevin Dendulk, Professor of Political Science at Calvin College, will introduce our guest. The dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 brought about some grand visions of the future. More democracy, more open markets, more freedom. Yet here we are, a quarter century on, witnessing a host of movements across the globe that don't seem to fit those earlier visions, including in a resurgent Russia itself. We need to understand why, especially in a country as large and influential as Russia. And so it's especially encouraging to have guides such as our speaker today. Jill Doherty is a familiar face to anyone who has watched CNN over the past 30 years. She joined the network in 1983, where she served in a variety of key posts, foreign affairs correspondent, Moscow bureau chief, White House correspondent, I had to add even Midwest correspondent um, earlier in her career. And during that remarkable career, she reported from more than 50 countries. But her greatest interest, and I think probably love, um, has been Russia. She developed that interest early with a bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan in Russian language and literature, and a career that started as a broadcaster and writer for Voice of America, USSR division. Since leaving CNN in 2013, she has been a fellow at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School and at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, where her research has focused on the role of mass media in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Ms. Doherty will be available to greet the audience in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following her presentation. Calvin College is grateful to GMB Architects and Engineers and the Peter C. and Emma Jean Cook Foundation for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Jill Doherty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? I guess you can. I can hear myself. Is it, the sound is okay? All right. Uh, well, boy, where do we begin? Kevin, you know, that was a great introduction because I think you captured kind of where we are right now. You know, if you go back to the period of the end of the Soviet Union, 1991, and there were a lot of hopes. There were a lot of hopes that Russia would, after throwing off communism, would join the West, would join Europe, the United States, and we would kind of live happily ever after. You know, 74 years of communism would be kind of forgotten or kind of a bad chapter in Russian history, and we would go on and cooperate, and, and that would be the end of it. And in fact, I remember, I was, you know, with CNN at that time, uh, in fact, the very day that the Soviet Union ended, which was essentially Christmas Day, 1991, I was a new White House correspondent, low man on the totem pole, and I had to work on Christmas. And I thought, oh, wow, you know, nothing's going to happen. I'll be stuck here. I won't get Christmas dinner, you know, the usual. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, it was the end of the Soviet Union. And that, that concept, you know, as I look at this, these, by the way, are photographs in no particular order, but they're ones that I've taken in the last few months. As I've been, I go to Russia a lot, so I'll comment on some. Others are just kind of background uh, pictures. But, you know, looking at St. Basil's Cathedral, which is on Red Square 
I'm sure some of you have probably been there and you've seen it, and thinking that that was the end of this country, this empire that had existed for 74 years, founded by Vladimir Putin, our arch enemy, really, for my entire life and beginning in 1917. To think that that was over was mind-boggling. And yet, I don't think that the end of the Soviet Union is over. <laughs> I think it's continuing. And I think that in order to understand what's happening in Russia, which really essentially is a young country, modern Russia, 1991 until now, we're talking about you know, 20, 25 years, quarter century of existence, even though the country Russia is ancient. But we're still going through, I think, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And it, it helps me to try to understand what's happening in Russia. It's a, you know, a huge, it has nine time zones, physically the biggest, physically, uh, geographically, biggest country in the world, stretching from all the way out in the east, the Pacific, all the way out to Kaliningrad in the West. As I told some of the students this morning, it used to be 11 time zones, and then they shortened it, they compressed it a little bit, and now it's only nine time zones, and we have, what, four? So it's huge. And um, so, you know, there we are at the end of the Soviet Union. To try to understand it, I think we have to look at that history. Hence the subject that I'm going to talk about, Russia, past, present, and future. So it's, it's a big task. Um, I don't pretend to really be able to explain it completely because Russia is a very complex country and it is changing very, very rapidly. Every time I go, I just took this picture maybe you know, three, four weeks ago right outside of Red Square. And you know, as I look at their uniforms and the pride and the whole thing, I can see a combination of ancient Russia, communism, which kind of still exists, or at least the images of, of communism, and then today, modern Russia and what it's trying to be. In, and in order to understand uh, Russia, I think we have to understand President Putin, because he really is the person, he's the decider, you know? He is the man who has really, um, I would say, defined and continues to, to define what Russia is about. So understanding him, there is no other force right now, no political force that can match him. He's the person who sets the tone. He is the person who is defining what modern Russia will be. So a lot of what I'll talk about will be Vladimir Putin. I have a personal history, by the way, with Putin. Um, in, I hate to say 1969, but 1969, I went to Russia for the first time. I was a, a, an exchange student, along with my twin sister, Pam. Uh, we both studied Russian in high school and uh, had four very solid years, then went on to uh, take advantage of a program that existed thanks to the federal government at that time to, under, to uh, study critical languages in other countries. And Russia was one of those languages. So we went to Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, lived in a dorm, had Russian uh, roommates. I've been back to the building um, not too long ago. When we were there, it was a decrepit 9th, 1812 building that had like no hot water, a bunch of students living in it. It was really pretty bad. And now it's kind of this luxury apartment building that, that I couldn't even get into because there was security and you know, great view in downtown Leningrad, but at St. Petersburg. But at that point, it was a mess. And guess who was at Leningrad State University when I went back for another course in 1970? Vladimir Putin. Uh, we did not know him. He, he wasn't studying with Americans, but he was a new, about to be new KGB agent, and he went to Leningrad State University, top notch. Moscow and Leningrad were the top universities, which they still are, and he studied law. So that's how he became a KGB agent. Um, now, 
as I was saying, the, you know, that collapse of the Soviet Union really, I think, does help to define what Russia is all about. Vladimir Putin was shocked by that, and as were a lot of Russians, that the structure that had held that country together was suddenly gone. But he was also shocked by a previous event, which I'm sure you know about, which was the fall of the Berlin Wall. And let me read you something. This just came out a few days ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. President Putin gave an interview to a German newspaper that's called Bild, B-I-L-D. It was the first big Western interview of the year that he gave. And listen to what he said about the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. The reporter said, what went so horribly wrong with the relationship between Russia and the West? Putin said, we've done everything wrong. And the reporter said, everything? And then he said, from the beginning, we failed to overcome Europe's division. 25 years ago, the Berlin Wall fell, but invisible walls were moved to the east of Europe. This has led to mutual misunderstandings and assignments of guilt. They are the cause of all of the crises ever since. And don't forget, you know, Vladimir Putin at that time, at the end, the, the fall of the wall, he was a KGB agent living in Dresden, Germany, which was really kind of a backwater. They really, they considered it kind of a backwater because it wouldn't, they couldn't even get uh, proper TV channels from Russia. They hardly knew you know, what was going on, but it was a, a seminal event in his life. There's a story about Putin that he tells. Let me see if I can, ah yes. I'm sorry I can't make this bigger, but that is Vladimir Putin as a KGB agent. Not very happy chap, but, um, <laughs> but a dedicated Soviet man. And I think I have one other which is Vladimir Putin as a young man, and I don't see a lot of difference, quite honestly, but, you know, a little bit of a sad sack, uh, you know, his eyes a little sad and everything. But this, I, I'll just diverge for a couple of seconds. As I was telling some of the students we met this morning, um, kind of cheap psychology 101, but, you know, Vladimir Putin grew up in Leningrad. Leningrad, as I'm sure a lot of people I can see in the audience who are more my vintage, would remember, now I don't remember World War II, but I remember about World War II. And uh, of course, the siege of Leningrad, the Nazi siege of Leningrad. Vladimir Putin grew up in Leningrad. He was born right after the war, 1952, but his parents went through it. And his father went to the front was shot up, he had a terrible, I mean, really horrible experience, shot up twice, um, crippled for most of his life, came back to the hospital in Leningrad. His wife went through the war and almost, as many people who lived in Leningrad, starved to death. And she was actually, Putin tells a story that his mother was taken out, she had collapsed from hunger, her body, they thought it was her body, was being collected to be taken off to a mass grave, but she was alive. They noticed at the last minute, her husband came out, this is, this is what he says, and I do believe it. They came out, her husband basically said, you know, get away, leave her here. He nursed her back to health. And it's a very dramatic, very traumatic story. So. When you look at Vladimir Putin as a kid, and then looking at him now, I think you have to remember these stories about his life and what formed him. And I can tell you, I've met him many times. Actually, I may be one of the only people in America who has been kissed by Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I am not kidding, I'm not kidding. I was at a reception, he, he had this big kind of conference and he was speaking, and then they had a cocktail party afterwards, and I thought, I have to, he, he knew me because I'd interviewed him before, but this time I thought, I have to get up there and ask him for another interview. So I charged through, I'm not very big as you can tell, charged through like this <laughs> to get up to him, and I said, Mr. Putin, you know, maybe you remember me, I was the bureau chief here, and he said, oh yes, yes, and I said, I would like to do another interview, and he said, well, here's the guy 
who's in charge of interviews, he points to his press secretary, I turn like that, and I get a giant kiss, whoops, sorry, on my cheek. And I wasn't quite sure whether I wash it off or whether I'm, you know, horrified or, or thrilled. But in any case, <laughs> that was Vladimir Putin. So, uh, so how do we understand him? Okay, so um, I do believe that one of the main things that he thinks about is the end of the Soviet Union and the resentment about the end of the Soviet Union. He is not going to allow Russia, as Leningrad and, Ru and the Soviet Union before were invaded by the Nazis. He simply is not going to let that happen. He has a chip on his shoulder. I'm speaking now kind of colloquially, but really this is, this is the mentality. He has a chip on his shoulder for the end of the Soviet Union, where he feels that the West, especially the United States, was triumphant. That we rubbed Russia's nose in the fact that the Soviet Union was over and that we had won. Now, my belief is that we didn't win the end of the Cold War. I really believe that the Russian people helped, although oil prices helped, there were many things that helped, but I do believe that this, the Russian people themselves helped to bring about the end of the Soviet Union and the end of communism, and that they should be congratulated for that. Now, it didn't all end the way we wanted, but it's ending the way I think the Russian people have decided. I, we can get into that later maybe in the questions. But let me give you an example of how Putin, in putting together his version of what Russia is, how this works. This picture I took when we visited, it's a beautiful building in St. In uh, Petersburg now. It is uh, called Smolny. It is the, the uh, center the, where the mayor lives. And when, at the end of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Putin was the guy in charge in Leningrad, and then it became St. Petersburg, for foreign investment. So he was the person, it's a very interesting job, he was the guy, if you wanted to invest in new, the new Russia, and especially in St. Petersburg, you would go and talk to Vladimir Putin. And so he had entree to a lot of Westerners, he dealt with business, these are things that are not often talked about, but they made, they, it was an important part of his job. So he had an office in this building. Now, look at this building. You have classical, you know, Russian building design. You have in the top, and I think I have a tight shot of that. You know, well, there's, okay, we'll start backwards. You have Lenin, founder of communism. That statue is still there. I took this picture about a year ago. Statue's still there pointing, as he does in so many cities, into the distance to communism. But you also have the czarist symbol, double-headed eagle, the old czarist days going back to, what, the 1600s when the Romanovs took over. And then you have the flag of, go back there, flag of modern Russia. And as Russia, you know, Putin, Yeltsin did this, but Putin is really putting together all of those elements. He's putting together czarist uh, grandeur, the concept of Russia and the czars and the, and the great history, the thousand-year history of Russia. He is putting together uh, Putin, I, I'm sorry, um, Lenin, and some of the things that Russians can be proud about in terms of the Soviet Union, which a lot of the time boils down to World War II and the victory of the Nazis, which cost them 20 million people. We have to remember that. And then he's also putting together modern Russia. Now, what, how is he doing that? How does he put those elements together? Well, I, th I would like to talk about one thing um, that isn't talked about too much. I mean, we could, of course, we could say um, military might. That's World War II, by the way. Oh, that is a cemetery. One more element about Vladimir Putin's past. He had an older brother who died during the war, and he was a little kid, a little, I think he was two years old when he died, 
And that poor little boy, Vladimir Putin's what would have been his older brother, was buried in a mass grave. And until recently, and I am talking last year, I think it was, somebody went back and looked into the history of the family and found out what cemetery his brother was buried in. And they were not buried individually. They were gathered together, all the bodies, and buried in these mass graves. So you see the mounds that come out like that of grass? There are thousands of people buried in that cemetery. And they have the years, 1941, 42, 43 were the worst in Leningrad. So, in, and, and in spite of some of that terrible history, um, Stalin, for example, part you know, of the victory during World War II, but also the person who murdered his own people. How do they combine these things? And you find odd things, like this is in St. Petersburg, Soviet cafe. I mean, 20 years ago, at the end of the Soviet Union, most people would say, Soviet Union, gone, that's it, we're glad it's over. Here, you have Soviet retro. I mean, I, it's astounding to me. I was just there, as I said, a, a few weeks ago, most at the most a month ago, for Christmas. And um, I bought a chess set for a little boy, and the chess set has all of the modern leaders of Russia. It had, the pieces were like czars and modern leaders. And it has Vladimir Putin, modern president you know, of Russia. And what does it have for the symbols? On one side of the game, it has the United States flag. And on the other side, it has the Soviet flag, not the Russian flag. So there's a lot of you know, Soviet retro coming back. It's in a very odd combination, but he's doing that. Now, one thing that Vladimir Putin does is, oh, and I, I notice the clock here is not working, so I think, Karen, you're going to have to take a hook and pull me off the stage, OK? If you give me a time check. Oh, there it is. OK, time remaining. OK. So um, Val, I want to talk about something which doesn't have a lot to do with the military, um, does have something to do with foreign policy, but it's not your, your typical way of explaining what's happening in Russia, or what motivates Putin, and that is values. Now, values, you know, we have a debate in the United States about values, right? traditional values, um, you know, Republicans, Democrats, who's more American, and all of this. But I think in the United States, you, there's general agreement about the values that Americans have, which would be um, freedom, democracy, equality, ability to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, do what we want to do, start businesses, etc. that everybody is equal before the law, and, and so that's kind of a, a given in our country. Put yourself in the place of Russians at the end of the Soviet Union. All of a sudden, it's not only the Soviet, the structure of communism, but it was the ideology of communism that died at that time. And what was the ideology of communism? The ideology of communism was workers of the world unite you have nothing to lose but your chains. Rise up, you know, against the capitalists. Spread communism. Everybody will be equal. You should spread it around the world. It was very much um, a proselytizing uh, belief, an ideology. It was supposed to apply to everybody around the world. It would put communism and capitalism in opposition to each other, and at the end, everybody would live in peace and harmony, and we would be equal. Now, the end of the Soviet Union comes, and that is that, the, that ideology dies to a certain extent. I mean, there are still communists, but that ideology dies. And what replaces it? In the beginning, in, like when Boris Yeltsin took over in 1971, was elected the Russian president, there was no real operating ideology. In fact, Boris Yeltsin started a commission 
This was about four years into the new Russia. He started a commission, and the job of that commission was to define the national idea. I mean, it's as if somebody sat down. Imagine, you know, like, our country's founded, and everybody sat down, and they had this commission that was supposed to decide what do we believe in. It wasn't, it wasn't organic, the way, you know, kind of ours evolved over hundreds of years, but they decided we really need something that people can believe in. So they start this commission, they have the gray beards, you know, the real thinkers. It existed for about a year, and they gave up, and <laughs> they disbanded, and they couldn't come up with a national idea. And my pet theory about Russia is if you want to explain kind of like the psyche of people or the psyche of Putin to a certain extent, although he is much more, I would say, um, real politique than his people. But I think you have to look at what are the motivational values that Russians have? What do they think their country is? I mean, these are basic questions. What is Russia? Where does it fit into the world? What does it believe in? I mean, really, the, these are things that are Russians are answering right now, and the way they're doing it is with kind of this, you know, amalgam, a pastiche. This is one of my, my favorite pictures. I took this at a press conference. His, his face changes in every single photograph. He's, it's really very odd. Whoops, there is. This is also a small, I'm sorry, it's a photo of a photo. That is Vladimir Putin as he-man. I think I have another one. Vladimir Putin as... Judo, and Vla oh, Vladimir Putin as, <laughs> this one I have to explain. This, <laughs> this says, I will get back to philosophy in a second. The, um, our answer, nash at viet, our answer to na sanctsi, sanctions, of the United States, esha a. Our answer to US sanctions, poof, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Putin, as you know, is a judo expert, so there he is, socking it to the United States. Tough guy. Anyway, the, oh, by the way, that is a, a T-shirt. That is a T-shirt that was on sale. They're on sale all over the place in Moscow, and they have a lot of, like, you know, U.S., get out of our faces. We don't fear. I have some other pictures you will see in a, a few minutes. But anyway, back to ideology um, and a serious part of it. So what, what do you do when you don't know what the meaning of your country is? Well, Putin decided to go back, and he is continuing this, and I would say it's picking up speed. He is using religion. That's one of the factors that he uses. Traditional Russian religion is Russian orthodoxy. Um, I think there was a little typo in the booklet. It's actually, it says, in the booklet that we have, it says 18% Orthodox. It's actually, that was under the Soviets, it was 18%. It's now about 72% of Russians say that they are Russian Orthodox, which I would expect. Now, do they go to church? Not too much. But they, at least in a general definition of who they are, they are Russian Orthodox. You also have other Christians, small numbers. You have Judaism, considered a traditional religion. And then you have a lot of Muslims, a lot of Muslims. Right now, the percentage of Muslims coming you know, from areas that used to be part of the Soviet Union and are still part of Russia is somewhere around 12 to 15% of the population is Muslim, which is really significant when you think of what they are doing in Syria. So, you, values, okay. Um, you have religion. You have, I would say, um, you have Russian exceptionalism. And, you know, we have American exceptionalism, but you have Russian exceptionalism, which says we are different, they say. We are different from the rest of the world. We're not really European, and we're not really Asian. Remember, they span both. They're Eurasian. But they are a unique people. I mean, Russians really do believe that they are unique. Don't we all? But they really do believe that they are unique. So Russian exceptionalism, 
It can also be used as a justification when it gets into this concept of the Russian world. I should almost list that as number two, the Russian world. The Russian world is a concept right now, an actual technical concept, which says that there are people all around the world who were left behind by the fall of the Soviet Union. And Putin's responsibility, he would argue, is to protect the interests of those Russians. Now, many of them really were left behind in the Soviet Union, but there are others in different areas. I mean, there are a lot of Russians in New Jersey. Now, I'm not quite sure whether he's planning on protecting Russians in New Jersey and New York, but um, he certainly intends on protecting their interest in other parts of the world, such as Ukraine. So this idea of a Russian world, the unique people who are drawn together by blood, by history, by religion, is used not only in a value sense, but in a political sense, to justify, in some cases, military action a la Ukraine. A lot of Ukraine, the incursion by Russia into Ukraine, can be explained by the Russian world. You also have the strong state. Now, Russia has always been a strong state, even under the czars. But the, it's important that the state is a primary um, entity. In the United States, it's the people who make up the state, we create the government. But in Russia, it's really the government is, is the power. There's a lot more concentration of power in the government. And also with Vladimir Putin, it is individual power. Uh, it's a highly personalized system in Russia. I mean, really, the influence of, of Putin, you cannot exaggerate it right now. I would, I would say it's unstable. When you put that much power in the hands of one person, it's unstable. But that is the way it works right now. You also have another value, which is Fortress Russia. Fortress Russia, right now, um, combines some of the ideas of World War II, um, exclusion and exceptionalism, with the more modern idea that Russia is surrounded by enemies. And, you know, I've, as I said, I've been in Russia a lot over the last couple of years. I've gone back every few months. And if there's one thing that I could tell you, the mood right now is very much we are surrounded, NATO is at our gates, NATO is going to try to take over Russia, take its natural resources, and, you know, just squish it into the ground and destroy it that the Americans are really trying to take advantage of us, the Russians, at every turn. And you know, whether, like, if I were to say that here, you know, in Grand Rapids, people would probably say, no, we aren't. Well, you know, we don't want to take over Russia. But people believe it in Moscow. They really do. And when you are fearful, you can support more radical Beliefs. You know, the, the polls show that Putin is extremely popular. His popularity rating is about 90%. And people also can accept different things, like they can accept more censorship, they can accept more government control when they feel that they are fearful. Remember us after 9-11. There was a lot more belief that, you know, we, we have to let the government do certain things to protect us because, after all, we're under attack. Same thing is happening in Russia. So, but the government is propagandizing that and saying that NATO is after us so that there's really a, a feeling of fortress Russia. Now, I would also say there are some other values, um, one of which would be um, when I said Russia, you know, as kind of a unique country, there is also this belief, although maybe among more radical Russian uh, traditionalists, that it's almost like a blood belief. And when they talk, they actually talk about blood and genetics. Now, that's a problem because Russians are very diverse. I mean, they have everybody. 
that you go to Moscow, there are people from Central Asia, there are Jews, there are Christians, there are people from the Baltics, they're all over the place. But there is somehow this idea that united by language, belief, culture, identity, that Russians can suffer and this is another thing that's, I think, really important. The sanctions, remember we were talking about sanctions, they say that because of the genetic makeup of Russians and their ability to suffer, here's you know, Russian culture at its height, women singing Russian folk songs, that they can survive almost anything. And right now, part of what the government is saying is the sanctions don't make any difference because we can survive them because we're strong because we're Russian. Here are some of those t-shirts I was talking about. Um, on the top left, USSR. Um, uh, there's Putin, I, that's one of my favorite, with the sunglasses. Cool Mr. Putin KGB agent. We have a lot of images of, uh, of Putin as kind of very stern, you know, strong leader of the nation. Um, this Rasia is now going back to the czars, and the, that's a symbol of Moscow. So again, this amalgamation of all sorts of images coming. So I know I want to get a lot of questions in, but I want to give you, that's my favorite, I think. Oh, and this one, interestingly, in English. Look at those muscles. <laughs> that was for the Sochi Olympic Games. Maybe we'll look at a few of these. Aha, you may, does anyone recognize that gentleman? Stalin. Stalin, exactly, very good. I took that picture four weeks ago. Uh, people are still laying flowers on the grave of Stalin at, outside the, uh, the gates of the Kremlin. Just a few little scenes. <laughs> a Kremlin party. Complete with bat that is a balalaika, a giant balalaika, and Mr. Putin. Now let's let's um, go into this. I'm, as I said, I want to get some questions. But what does Putin want? Okay, I get this asked a lot, and I always go, Oh wow, where do we start? Does he want the Soviet Union back? No, I don't think he wants the Soviet Union because he's not a communist. But what he wants is the restoration of the impact, the power, uh, the importance, the influence of Russia. He wants Russia back on the world stage. He wants, as he put it, there's a new national security strategy that just came out for Russia. And here's how they put it. Increase the competitiveness and the international prestige of Russia. So you will do it any way you can. So how does he do it? He, he, will, he wants to restore Russia's strategic control over the post-Soviet areas, all of those areas that they lost at the end of the Soviet Union. He believes, it's kind of like our Monroe Doctrine, if you remember our Monroe Doctrine. In our hemisphere, we were supposed to have influence. What he believes is all of the perimeter of Russia, which is now, he would say, more vulnerable, and NATO has come up to it, all of those countries that existed as part of the Soviet Union, he believes should be a buffer. He believes that Ukraine should be a buffer. He doesn't really believe, and he said this, that it's really a country, <laughs> although it is, of course, but he, there's some feeling that it's kind of still part of the Soviet Union and that Russia should have influence there that, that it had under the Soviet Union. He believes in somehow, he's, they're quite demeaning about the Baltics. I know, by the way, I'm very excited that we have people listening in or maybe watching from Lithuania, a shout out to Lithuania, which is right there in the Baltics. I spent quite a bit of time, two months uh, over the fall in Estonia, right next door. And there's somehow that feeling that all of these perimeter areas should be the, the area of the influence of Russia. So he does want to restore that, or at least, you know, preserve it. He wants to be influential in Europe. 
He wants the West to come to terms with Russia and then continue integration. In other words, he wants to integrate, but he wants it on his terms. And he is willing to take advantage, I think, of any opportunity that he has to do that. I do not feel that he wants economic reform as much as he says he wants, because true economic reform would weaken his control and the control that the Kremlin has and the power structure of the Kremlin, which is very tied up to business interests, to the military, and to the entire system. If you begin to unravel that with real economic reform, it is a threat to the control by Putin and the other people who control Russia. So I don't think he wants economic reform in the way that maybe some, some Russians would hope. He wants to hold on to power. He does not want any threat to his power. And I believe that he will go as far as the West will let him. Now, that, I mean, sounds ominous, and I think, um, to a certain extent, it is. Look at those eyes, you know? What, what are behind those eyes? What do you think? I think, right now, um, you have him in a power play in Syria. You, I don't know how that's going to turn out, because defeating ISIS the way he thinks he's going to do it will be very difficult. You can't defeat it from the air. You have Ukraine, which didn't work out exactly the way he wanted. That's one of the reasons, perhaps, that he turned to Syria and was more active, so people would kind of stop thinking about Ukraine, where it's kind of a frozen conflict. You have an economy that's in trouble. You have oil prices. Look at oil prices. What, $32, $30? Maybe going down? which is frightening to Russia. Uh, you have, he's ostracized from a lot of organizations. He's no longer in the G8. So you have, I think, not a very strong hand. But I, but I will tell you one thing. Putin is going to play his hand as strongly as he can. That is one thing that he does. So I would look right now for possibly another place that he could create a certain, shall we, say, shall we say, challenge to the West. I would look for Moldova and some other areas where the Russians are already involved, but he could take some type of destabilizing action. I don't think things are going to remain stable with Putin, because they can't. He's not winning, and yet he's not losing but he is scoring a whole lot of points. So I would look for more challenges to the West, which will really be a challenge to the United States and to whoever is the next president. That is going to be a challenge, because Putin, although again, his hand isn't very strong, he is able to, we're talking about him, he's able to project his influence and power in an amazing way. And he's going to do that Witness what happened when he kind of injected himself into our election with Donald Trump, the comments about Donald Trump, and the buddy-buddy with Donald Trump, uh, which kind of blew my mind. I was in Moscow when it happened, and I thought, what? But, you know, so Vladimir Putin is, in a sense, part of our debate. He's, he's there. So he's not going away. He is very powerful at this point. The only thing... I think, and maybe I'll sum up on this, is I do not think that, that system is stable. Because in the United States, with all of the problems that we have, we have a big base, a base of people, we have non-governmental, you know, not-for-profit organizations, we have civic society, we have political structure, and then it goes up and up and up and it gets smaller, and then we have the president. In Russia, it's reversed. This is basically what it's like. We have the president up here and the power structure, you know? Power structure, Kremlin, military, media, all sorts of controls. And then it kind of goes down to the people who don't have a way of exerting a whole lot of influence on the government. 
What happens to a triangle, you know, when it's like this? It can topple. And I think that that's one of the problems. They, he has created a whole lot of power balancing very precariously, and that is not stable. So it's a, it's a strange time. Every time I go back, I wonder, you know, ratings at 90%, but realistically, can this go on? And I think the only way it can go on is by creating more enemies, unfortunately and more challenges to Russia, which means that he has to project force a little bit more, maybe in areas that we don't expect. And that is not good. <laughs> that can create real problems, and especially, I think, going into a new election, our leaders, whoever they are, have to realize that he is going to be challenged for the rest of his time in office. And Putin could be in office until I think it is about 2024. So, you know, he can get in, he's in office now for eight years, for uh, six years. He can get another six years. He'll be around for a long time. So they're gonna have to deal with him whether we like it or not. So I'd love right now to get some questions. Um, Karen's going to help me. And uh, Karen, first. Let's say thank you. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you. I want all of you to know that we do, in fact, have a lively audience coming from LCC International University in Lithuania. We right now have more questions from them oh, wow. than from the United States. <laughs> and that's saying quite a bit. But I'm going to start... I bet I know the first one. I'm going to start with a closer one. Okay. All right. No, no, you go ahead no, and guess. No, no, no. Guess. Guess. I no. want the, the joy of listening to that question coming from there. Right. It, will Putin invade the Baltics? But that's only my guess. If I'll wonderful. bet a nickel. That's one of them. You've got okay. a lot. What's your answer? No, not now. Okay. <laughs> not yet. Here's, uh, this actually builds on what you were just saying. If, if Putin, this is from here, if Putin has a fatal heart attack tomorrow, what happens to Russia? Ooh. That, you know, that's a really, really good question. Wow. Well, I mean, there is a certain structure. You have um, his prime minister. Remember, the prime minister used to be the president in this kind of the switcheroo, Mr. Medvedev, where Putin was the president, then he stepped aside, Medvedev came, became the president, and then Medvedev stepped aside, and then Putin. I mean, they're all elections, but essentially, Medvedev is the prime minister, so you'd have Medvedev. But if Putin left, Medvedev really is not a powerful personality. He's a very, he's a, a not a very powerful person, period. And because Putin controls everything. So I think there would be grave, grave challenges. It would be a very serious thing. You, um, it would be totally unpredictable. Uh, I do want to say that if you have questions you'd like to write down and look for an usher, they'll deliver them. This one comes from Lithuania. What is your opinion about the post-Soviet states, specifically the Baltic states, and their strive to separate themselves from Russia economically and become energetically independent? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, I lose. I lose a nickel. That's just one. Because I thought it was going to be the invasion question, but I'm sure there, there is one. Yeah. No, I, do, I, think, um, I think the Baltics are doing a great job. Actually, I, as I said, I was in Estonia. And, um, you know, it's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, three Baltic countries who all had their own history in Europe. They were not, they, although the Tsars had influence, in fact, owned them at various times. Essentially, they are European countries who were forcibly taken into the Soviet Union and then got their independence at the end of the Soviet Union in 1991. And they are all intent on defining themselves as Europeans. I find it very inspiring, actually. Um, Estonia has done a terrific job on economic reform. They do have problems, but I think, you know, the, the Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians are really countries that we should look toward for what can happen in a good sense at the after, you know, communism goes and countries that really strive to rebuild themselves and do reform. 
I think the only, the only dangerous signal that we have, and it's happening in Poland, and you see a little bit of it in the Baltics, is it, but especially in Poland right now, is a return to kind of a more uh, central control, nationalist, sometimes verging on fascist type of behavior. You're seeing it in Hungary, seeing some of it in Poland, and that's a danger in some of those post-Soviet areas. Here's one from a student. Has the Russian sentiment toward the United States always been negative? And how has it changed over the past no, 70 years? No, I don't think it has. Um, you, know, you know who helped us during the Revolutionary War? Russia. Russia helped us during the Revolutionary War. Who helped us during the Civil War? Russia helped the North during the Civil War. Um, when I was a student in, in Leningrad, and throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s, I never thought the Russian people were anti-American. It was, of course, the government tended to be, <clears throat> but a lot of the average people were very welcoming. And I always want to separate that, and I think a lot of Russians separate government from people. Now, that is a slippery slope, because in the United States, I don't think the division is as stark. You know, in Russia, there really is a difference between the government, because a lot of times people don't, people don't have influence on their government. But I think if you took an average Russian per person, they are not really anti-American. They're fearful. They're fearful of us. And that creates problems. Then they become kind of anti-American. Um, I would add one more thing, though. The younger people, and I don't mean 30-year-olds, I mean 20-year-olds and the teenagers, are more anti-American than the 30s and 40-year-olds. That, that is a weird thing that's happening right now. Older people, um, you know, are kind of anti-American, but you would expect the younger they get, the more liberal, open to the West they are. No, the younger ones, they don't remember the bad old days in the Soviet Union, and they do regret the fact that they are not the kick, pardon my language, the kick-ass country that they were as the Soviet Union was. They are not, they, they want to be powerful again. And that is a very strong motivating factor for teenagers and young kids in their 20s in Russia. At the end of the Soviet era, Milton Friedman was consulted about their future economic course, and he advised privatize. Later, he said he should have advised establish rule of law first. Do you agree? <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. I think a lot of the structures, you know, if there's one thing that I, that I would have done if we were at the end of the Soviet Union, I think it would help them. And we did, but not as much perhaps as we should have. I think we would have made everyday life better for people because when they lost communism and their factories shut down, democracy was just an empty word. We talked about this this morning. Democracy didn't mean anything. Democracy meant I lost my job. Democracy meant I lost free health care. And, and a lot of those basic things, the things that you know, government should help people with, were destroyed. So when they looked at the democracy, they thought, what did democracy do for me? Thanks, no thanks. And, and also, I think, um, what was the, the, th the second phrase that he had on the... Um, Just let me get my files. Establish yeah, rule, rule of law. law. Yeah. Rule of law. If you cannot trust that your courts are going to protect you, if you cannot trust that your police witness what's happening in the United States right now, with Black Lives Matter and other things like that. If you don't have trust that you are equal before the law, then I don't think you have a society. And in Russia right now, people feel they are not equal before the law. A lot of people. A lot of people. And that is a problem. Is Putin <clears throat> serious about interfering in Syria and so forth as a way to protect Christians and Russian-speaking people in those areas? I think on that level, yes. I think that he is. Um, there are a lot of Russian uh, women who married Syrians, interestingly enough. When mm -hmm. Soviet Union and Syria were buddies uh, during the Cold War, there are a lot of Russian women um, who married Russians, and there are a lot of Christians there, and it is a big concern. In fact, that's why the Russian Orthodox Church 
um, has supported a lot of the action in Syria, specifically to support. That said, you know, every time Putin does something that sounds positive, and, and he can do good things. I'm not trying to criticize Mr. Putin, but I always wonder, and what's the other payoff that he gets? <laughs> you know, there's always a little subtext. So that's another way of just kind of uniting people to support the war effort. We have a couple questions about Russia's attitude toward or relationship with China. Could you talk about that, please? Oh, yes. I think that's another great question. You know, Russia, um, right now, if you go to Russia, they'll say, well, you know, sanctions, the West is imposing sanctions on this. That doesn't make any difference because China is our good friend. And China is going to make all the difference. We don't need the West. We don't need to export our energy to the West. We'll export it to China. Now, China is having some economic problems, as you have noticed, and uh, the import of energy may diminish, which will be a problem for Russia. Russia thinks that China is its savior, but China is very, very smart. I mean, China knows that Russia is a good market, but it's not the market. It's not equal to the United States, to the West, to Western Europe, and other parts of the world. So I think they are now trying to talk a good game in terms of you, you know, both countries uniting against the West. But the Chinese are not going to unite with Russia against the West. It makes no sense economically. China wants to sell things to the West. And so we are going to be in a relationship, the United States, with China forever. And, the chi and Russia is using China as an excuse for saying that they can get through this period of being ostracized from the West. But I think a lot of it's hot air. I've got to change the subject. And could you maybe stay another three or four hours? We have more. I'd love to. <laughs> I, seriously, um, I can go on and on, believe me. But... Um, <laughs> Here's an email uh, on behalf of the 14-year-old daughter who's a Russian adoptee. Oh. President Putin signed an adoption oh. ban for Americans in December oh, 2, 2012. Yes. Will this ever change? Why or why not? Oh, that's so sad. We talked about this with the students this morning. In brief, the Russians countering a law that we passed uh, to get a, to us to um, limit and control and put on sanctions list some Russians who were involved in the killing of a lawyer, um, I won't get into all these details, they passed a law that made it virtually impossible for Americans to adopt children in Russia. It's a very cruel, I think, the height of cruelty to make those children pay for it. But what they said was, you know, Russians can take care of ourselves, and why should these foreigners be adopting our children anyway? Well, the reason they were adopting them is because Russians traditionally didn't adopt, and these kids were languishing in hospitals and orphanages. It was a terrible situation. And so there are a lot of people, I'll bet there are people in this audience who have adopted children from that area. And it saves those children. But the Russians, you know, right now, for reasons that I think are the height of cruelty, disguised as protecting the rights of Russians. Um, for, they say a couple of children were killed by their American parents. Yes, that actually did happen. And it's horrible. But that sometimes happens. You know, cruelty does happen. But overall, Thousands of children have been rescued, and I don't think it's going to change in the near future. We have students asking for advice, particularly for women and or foreign language majors who'd like to pursue careers in foreign affairs. Oh, I think that's great. You know, I'll tell you, I know times are different, uh, because when I was growing up, the Soviet Union was a big deal, and uh, I, you know, my entire career basically came about because I studied Russian. But, you know, Russian is get, having a, a rebirth. And also I would say, you know, Chinese, Arabic. One of the students who uh, introduced today was German, you know, speaking German. Um, I think foreign languages are a gr great way to have a career. It's a, an incredibly good tool. I learned more when I was 19 turning 20 in a Russian dormitory than I learned in classrooms. I'm serious. 
you know? Going, going to the banya when we ran out of hot water and listening to those ladies, these are the bathhouses, you know, where the women beat you with birch twigs and it's kind of Nordic type of thing, and they would talk about the war. I'm serious, you know, it was, it was really something. Why are you American girls so skinny? You know, eat! <laughs> uh, was, I heard that a lot, too. But anyway, I would say, study as many languages as you can. Our country, you know, I wish I spoke better Spanish, you know? Um, it's important, and it can definitely lead to a career. You can only answer this in the two words that it takes, but what's your favorite Russian novel? Uh, is somebody asking that again? No, it's, I'm asking it's you. you again. Okay, I would say, okay, all time, Anna Karenina. Yeah. Absolutely. We need to know. Um, I read it when I was young, I read it now. Just a couple, a few years ago, I went back to school to get my master's. I thought I was bored. Uh, well, I, I was not bored. I was covering the State Department with Hillary Clinton at the time. I was not bored. I'm surprised I was able to do it. But I wrote a paper on uh, Anna Karenina, and I think it is one of the most brilliant things I've ever read. It had a lot of significance to me as a woman of my age. Um, and, and also a woman, although I haven't had an affair, it did, uh, it was, it really, it's society and how they treat women, fascinating novel. Good answer. <laughs> the last question, and we'll end on this note, is uh, Jill, why aren't you running for president? Well, actually, I, you know, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to keep this until the end, because I actually, <laughs> I actually am running for president. Um, I decided to jump in. Everybody else is doing it. And I figure, <laughs> that's why I'm wearing bread, you know, to stand out. Um, I actually think that I should run for president because everybody has an opinion, so why not? Right. But, you know, I will say, on a serious note, I will say something that I said to the students this morning. And this will be my stump speech. You know, all you, if you, to, to understand that you're an American, and to understand that we actually are all much more alike than we want to admit, I will tell you, just go abroad. Just go to Russia. Just go to some other country. I spent two years in Hong Kong. Go to China. Go to Russia. Go to Africa. And you will see that we think we're Republicans and Democrats and we're angry at the government and all of that. But we actually are Americans, and we are much more alike. And we share values that all you have to do is take us out of the United States, where we're slowly but surely tearing ourselves apart, and put us in another country, and you will see that we're all quintessentially Americans. And I'm not just saying that. I absolutely believe it. And I've seen it, I saw it. I'll tell you one, one thing, I didn't tell you this, Karen. I'm in a ritzy hotel in Moscow three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. They have piped in music. It is filled with all of these shaved head billionaires who basically knock you over. And just, you know, if you're not in a white Mercedes, they don't care. And I'm in the, in the lobby of this, you know, really kind of conspicuous consumption hotel. The, the music is piped in, and they have jazz, a kind of New York-style jazz, and I listened to the melody, and I thought, I know that song. It's God Bless America. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I thought, that I couldn't make it up. So it's like, God Bless America. You know, and I thought, absolutely, absolutely. God bless. You can greet yeah. future President <laughs> Doherty in the lobby after this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.